Okay, here we are for the last tape of this semester. So far we've had fire alarms, unbearable noise, computer crashes. I have left my cell phone on on purpose for the first time because I know someone's going to call me. We must have a clean sweep. Also, I do not intend to re-record this because I want this very unique semester to live on in posterity, right? So you'll be seeing it for a while. It's a very interesting semester. I had a lot of fun, and somehow with all the stuff, we're on schedule, maybe even a little ahead. Okay, we're going to finish up Kohlberg and moral development today. Let me uh, again remind you, what Kohlberg tells us is that reasoning develops, reasoning develops as a result of interaction with the environment. And so he's going to make an interesting case. He is going to tell you, yeah, people are basically born rotten. Right? They're born with preconventional reasoning, or it soon develops. But as we interact with the environment, our reasoning gets better and better, and we basically become more and more moral. Or our reasoning about moral issues becomes better and better. Okay? It's an interesting ontological question. Are people born good or people born evil? It's an axiological question. You know, what's the nature of people? Are people born good and evil? And Kohlberg says, well, People are born with the capacity to develop to the highest levels of moral reasoning if they have the proper environmental interactions. Okay? So what he tells us, let's go back to the PowerPoint just as a reminder. What he tells us is that we start with preconventional reasoning. What's moral is what's good for us. And if you remember, at this stage, the second stage in this level, whoops, instrumental hedonism, okay, People have questioned, come back to me if you can, people have questioned whether, why can't we all live that way? And the answer is, a few people can. A few people spend their lives exploiting the rest of us. Okay? Pigeon drops and con games and, right? If I kick you two steps down the ladder, it makes me look higher. But the problem is you really cannot run a society that way. And Kohlberg noticed, like everyone else, that things are... <coughs> <laughs> we would cooperate, we're more productive, <coughs> and in the end, we would wind up killing each other or <coughs> not trusting each other, being, oh, well, that's, that's what happened today. I got a cold this morning and I'm coughing all the time. It's, it's good. It's a good semester. It's a lot of fun. We would not be able to, we would not be able to live as a society unless we had some conventions. That's why I call it conventional reasoning. Certain things that we all agree upon. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. Let me get my picture in the corner there somewhere. Okay, and a conventional reasoning, we begin by basically identifying with fairly small groups, at least initially, and following the rules of the group. And if you remember, these rules, these are often just conventions that we all follow, or the conventions are set by other people. Okay? And the conventions often tend to be, come back to me for a second if you can, uh, the, conventions, the conventions tend to be things that really don't make too much sense, well, you've got to wear. I, I remember my father, uh, my father, my grandfather was a tailor at his own store, I don't know, ever, practically from the time he got to the United States, I don't know, 50 years, he was sewing there, or something like that, 45 years. My father would go, go after school and help him sew. My father was a pretty good tailor, knew clo clothes well. And so one time, you, you, you know, I don't know, he needed a little extra money, so he would sell clothes in a department store downtown. One day he comes back and he says, I told you I was right. Brown pants with a blue coat are out. Can't wear them anymore. He always hated that style. Okay? So they're switching. Now it's horrible. Ever seen me wear brown pants with a blue coat? You can't wear that. It's got to be great pants with a blue coat or tan pants with a blue coat. That's what caught on. It was in the 50s and it's stayed around ever since. Okay, it's just a convention. Who cares? I don't know if there's anything wrong with brown pants. With blue. Looks lousy, right? Why? Okay, conventions, but conventions can often have deep emotional kinds of eyes on this. Okay, I'll give you an example. We have conventions about what beauty is. If you look at art in the Middle Ages, okay, the Middle Ages, particularly uh, uh, at the time when the church was in a lot of control, you sort of had to go like this to express erotic themes. You know, I sort of twist a little. So they would do it by painting um, images from Greek and Roman mythology, right? 
And if you look at the penguins from the Middle Ages, you have to look at Venus, okay? Venus is the ultimate in feminine beauty, right? If you look at the pictures of the Venus from the Middle Ages, took that Venus and brought it today, right away she has to go on the Atkins diet, right? Go fat, right? The Venus, women were being more plump, I don't know the word, right? Weighing more, having more fat on them was considered beautiful. And in those days, women who were very skinny were considered haggard, not good. There's even some literature, ugly looking. Fade them, okay? So they get better looking. Right? And by the way, I still remember Twiggy, the model, it was in the 70s. She came up, you people used to look at this emaciated. Right? Now, oh, then, ooh, that became, that was the in thing. Right? Anorexia here, beautifica, right? You had to be anorexic to be beautiful. I don't know. So, but that has deep emotional feelings. You're feeling, oh, that's beautiful or it's not beautiful. Oh, that's a nice, co that's a nice style or it's not a nice style, but it's all based on convention. Ultimately, of course, I told you a story about my son's vans, right? That whole stuff. Ultimately, the problem with conventions <coughs> is that you find people who run into different conventions. I told you about the story about the, the secretary who couldn't believe the two guys didn't celebrate Christmas, right? Yeah, yeah, sure I did. Yeah, about, you know, one was from Iran and one was from Israel. And they, the conventions, so conventions change and you often have people who have different conventions. When you get a complex society like ours, conventions are just different, okay? And what happens, the problem with running by conventions, if you really get into conflict, then there's really no way to solve them other than to say, I'm good and you stink. Gang wars are from conventions, right? Uh, we talked about that. Feuds are from conventions. You're good, you're bad, I'm good, that kind of thing. And of course, what comes from these conventions, unfortunately, is stereotype. Remember I sang you the Jet song, right? One of the most interesting lines in there, you know, every Puerto Rican is a lousy chicken. They're all that way. We don't like them because they're not like us, and they're all that way. Okay, of course, they knew it wasn't true, because when they said, let's have a fight, the, the, the Puerto Rican gang was ready to come. But they're all bad. They're all this way. Well, and sometimes it's the other way around. You know, we try, oh, Hispanics, they all have trouble looking you in the eye. That's, a, that's one I heard. I mean, what are you talking about, right? Oh, all these students are good in math. Oh, all third world people are this way, and all Euro-Americans are that way. What a, how ridiculous can you get? And ultimately, right, it keeps you from judging people as individuals. And that's my big bugaboo with multiculturalism that is often practiced. It often says, you, know, you have your culture, I have mine. There's nothing to talk about. Okay, there's no common standard for humanity. And, but worst of all, there's no way to solve, to solve problems. And so what you ultimately get, and by the way, this has deep emotional things too. I gotta tell you a story. I tell you a story about the three guys playing basketball. There was, the, this was an article written many, many years ago by a woman who, I think she was the coach of the women's Olympic basketball team. Anyway, she was one heck of an athlete and she, she worked at a, a college somewhere and she had an office with a window that overlooked the basketball cart. And the basketball cart was open to um, the kids from the street after, after in the evening, right, when there were no classes, the kids could come there. And she said she saw three kids playing. A black kid, I, well, she, she didn't know them, she just looked at a kid who was a black kid, a white kid, whatever that means, and an Asian kid, whatever that means, okay, whatever black kid. But she looked at them, and she said they were all lousy. They were just terrible basketball players. And they would play with each other and play and play and play. And she said they were getting a little better, you know, because they were playing with each other. One day, the Asian kid disappears. And it's just the black kid and the white kid playing. And she said that after a couple of weeks, the white kid disappears. The black kid would come by himself, and he went on until the end of the semester playing by himself. And what she concluded was, well, black kids are supposed to be good in basketball. So he stayed and practiced. And the other two, who were not very good, because neither was this kid, they were all lousy, she said, right, to start. Stayed. So it influences our self-attitudes of who we are and what we are, what we're supposed to be good doing and not doing, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes I gotta tell you, my, my mother, two, three brothers and sisters, anyway, they, her whole family, they were high school chess champions. She was a high school chess champion and her, I think four or five, they all went to the same high school. Four of them, or five of them, were high school chess champions. My mother had a lot of brothers and sisters, right? Uh, so I learned how to play chess. How can I say this nicely? I'll be kind to myself. I stink, okay? 
It used to bother me. And then I'd go and play with my uncles, and oh, they'd look at me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What's wrong with this guy, right? I was supposed to be good. Everybody in the family is good in chess. Two of my cousins are good in chess. I don't know how good they are, but they're better than I am. You know, that kind of stuff. I'm just not good in chess. I don't have the patience for it. Sit and think and think. Come on, Moa. So it's that kind of thing, you know. It made me feel like there was something wrong with me that I just wasn't good in chess. I'm just not. What can I tell you? Okay, so these conventions can have emotional impacts on people. You have to be careful about labeling people. I'm going to label myself. That's why I hate the label. Oh, you're learning disabled. There's something wrong with you. You're a defective person. What do we need them for? Each person should be treated as an individual. We're going to get to that. Kohlberg says that ultimately, you see, ultimately the trouble with this, even if you have a, you, he, we talked about stage four. I want to go over that again briefly. At stage four, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, I'll get there, don't worry. At stage four, Kohlberg says, what happens in morality consists of following the law and abiding by legal agreements. There's an understanding of con contractual obligations. Okay? And disagreements are settled by going to court. And following the proper legal procedures is a fundamental part of morality. Okay? This is crucial. Come back to me for a second. Okay, I know we went over this, but... What happens here now, does anyone, what is the symbol of justice in the United States? You all know the woman holding up the scale and, push it down, say it. She went like this. She has a blindfold. She's blind. Okay, she has a blindfold. What does the blindfold mean? The blindfold means I go into court. Here are two people having a dispute, right? And I'm a witness. Here are the two people, right? Okay, raise your hand. Person one is my cousin. Person two, I don't know him from Adam. <clears throat> Judge asked me, what do you think I'm going to say? I saw it. It's all her way. That's stage three reasoning. She's part of my club. I don't care about him. Right? That's why justice is blindfolded. I can't look and see who she is and who he is. I have to tell the truth. I have to weigh the evidence. So in court, you need to weigh the evidence. And what you get is... The idea now that we have a way to resolve things based on the law. We follow the law. We have contractual. And let's say I make a, con a, a, a contract with somebody else. Tell me your name. He's been sitting back there all semester. Push it down. Daryl. Say it again? Daryl. Daryl, right. You told me that once before, a long time ago. And then I find out he's one of them. Whatever them is. I don't know. He's a flute player and I like drums. Whatever. Or he's in this family and I'm in that family. Or he's in this, uh, that. Or he's, are you a Yankee fan? Oh, thank God. He's a Yankee fan. I don't like the Yankees, right? But they have to be a good team. No fun hating a lousy team. Okay? So it doesn't matter. It's stage three. It matters. I'm not having anything to do with him. It's stage four. We signed the contract. The deal's a deal. It was mutually agreed upon. We went into it together, not like in school where they say, sign this, sign this, sign this, sign this, sign this. You have to sign it. Your parents have to sign it or else you can't go into activity. That's not a contract. Okay, you can say, well, I'm going to negotiate this clause and renegotiate that one and insert this one and take out that one. That's not a contract. It's just telling the kid. I'm not saying sometimes you need to do that, but, you know. Contracts are mutually agreed upon. And by the way, contracts are void under one condition that a person can show that today's a he, day he or she was coerced into the contract. One time I was on a jury. That's what a guy was claiming. He said, I was coerced. Signed a contract. Then he wanted to get back out of it. He said, I was coerced. We decided he wasn't, but that was the point. Okay, because it has to be mutually agreed upon. The judge has to be fair, not favor one side or another. And the things have to be judged on the merits of the case and on the basis of the law. What is the difference between a prose prosecutor and an inquisitor? between a prosecu prosecutorial system that we have and an, inc and an inquisition system. Inquisitional system? A system that has an inquisition. Anybody see Mel Brooks' History of the World? The Inquisition, the Inquisition. <laughs> it's a, right? What is the difference between an inquisition and a prosecution? It's interesting. They're both legal systems. They're both people who have a right to pursue. Yeah, go ahead. An inquisitor. How's an inquisitor different from a prosecutor? Go ahead. I could be completely wrong. Yeah. But I'm going to say that a prosecution system assumes that you're innocent before proven guilty, and an inquisitorial, you're guilty until proven innocent. It's this close. She's almost there. 
For instance, you have a prosecutorial system in like French law. They assume you're neither innocent nor guilty. Let's get at the facts. But that's close because a prosecutorial system looks to see whether you have broken the law. Okay? A prosecution prosecutes around the law. An inquisition goes after a breaking of the law. A prosecution goes after the law. An inquisition goes after a person. Okay? So I'm going to do an inquisition. I'm going to take this person and see what he did. Tell me your name again. Brandon. Brandon. Brandon, you think if I examined every aspect of your life, I could uh, find something you did illegal or not? <laughs> he said probably. Brandon, if I put you in jail for one day for every time you rolled through a stop sign, how long would you spend in jail? Several years. <laughs> Several years? <laughs> right. right. He, he, he'd get out just in time to collect a Social Security pension, right? Okay, we all break the law. So if I go after someone, if I go after someone, that's an inquisition. A, a prosecutorial system based on law says you're not allowed to do that. Because that's a personal thing. I'm out to get you. I'm out to get you. In, an, in a... In a I, I'm out to say, did you or did you not break the law? I must tell you, by the way, that one of, that's one of the reasons why some of the Republicans, when Clinton was impeached, voted not guilty. They even said it, not quite like that, but they said, you cannot go after a person and say, okay, I'm going to go after you until I see, catch you doing something wrong. It started out with a financial scandal and wind up with some sex scandal. What the heck is that? You were there to prosecute this case. Did he or did he not break the law regarding this Whitewater stuff? <coughs> How do we wind up with it, investigating everything else? Okay, and, and that's, by the way, the special prosecutor is gone because I even saw one person call it that. said it became an inquisitor. Can't do that. That's one reason, by the way, why in many instances you're not allowed to mention the person's past history. The person is not, that's not relevant. What's relevant is, what's relevant is the law now. And you can run a society very well that way. We do. But in our country, we even have a supreme law of the land. Okay? Which is what? The supreme law of the land of the United States is the Constitution, right? The Constitution. So if you, if, if this municipality passes a law, <laughs> eventually it can be found to be not a law because it violates the supreme law of the land. Like that's happened. School districts have passed, so I have to salute the flag. Some religious groups, well, this is a real case, the Seventh-day Adventists said we're not going to do it. But interesting was because they appealed to a different law, which was the Bible. The Bible says you can't pledge allegiance to anyone but God. Something like that. I don't know Seventh-day Adventist theology too well, but that's the, the idea. So it was when so somebody said, it's the law, they've got to stand up, and they said, no, it's God's law, you don't. That, by the way, is why God can never get tenured at university, you know. First of all, what's God written lately? <laughs> Your past record doesn't count. And second, what he's written is open to so many different interpretations, you never know what's going on. <laughs> so that's, but anyway, this is obviously their interpretation. Ultimately, it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court struck down the law of the school district, of, of the state. I think it was West Virginia, but I won't swear to it. Okay? So no, it's not a law, it's unconstitutional. Can't do it. That's coercion of a religion. Well, that's not always true, right? There are certain religious groups that wear hats all the time. And then when the army, they wanted to wear their hats even when the army called for removing the hat. It went to the Supreme Court and said, no, you've got to wear it. You've got to remove them when it says you have to remove them. Okay, so it, it goes both ways, but it's based trying to base the Constitution. Now, interestingly enough, the reason that I pointed to the Ten Commandments last time is that this idea of the law being supreme over any person actually starts, at least in Western tradition, with Mosaic law. I think I talked about the Hammurabi Code last time, didn't I? I talked about that. Hammurabi was a king in Mesopotamia, which is basically Fertile Crescent, where Iran and Iraq are now. And he had a, a, a legal set of codes and laws, but the king was above the law. The law didn't apply to the king. Well, in Moses' law, that was true, too. The king was above the law, but the king was God, right? So any mortal king, any human, was not above the law. And that's basically what happens here. That's why we say we're a government of, l of men. We used to say, now I guess we have to say people. 
We're not a government of people. We're a government of laws, not of people. So the fact that you're the president, or you're rich, or you're this, or you're that, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter, right? And we, and we have certain changes in our, in our system of jurisprudence based upon that. For instance, there was a time where if people couldn't afford a lawyer, tough luck. Or you'd get a, uh, you'd get a uh, public defender, but if there were three pub five public defenders and you have 70 cases, well, they couldn't cover them all, so you'd have to go without them. That because they can't do that. If they have equal def protection under the law. Of course, we know that if you can pay some lawyers and other lawyers, we know that that's, but it bothers people. Because the law should apply equally to everyone. It bothers people. Okay? People who enforce the law should apply equally to everyone. If you ever watch Law and Order, you will notice that that comes up from time to time. This idea of prosecuting, I mean, uh, uh, the one who does it well is the original one. The, the one was called Adam Schiff, right? The original prosecutor. He talks about compromises he makes with that principle over politics. And, it, and he does, he's a good actor. He's very good low-key actor. It bothers him. Okay. <coughs> So these are the kinds of questions. Of course, we talked last time, we talked about laws that are, did we talk about laws that are not moral? <coughs> yeah. Here's the problem. The problem is now, you have to remember, that I am now saying that what is moral is what is legal. If it's legal, it's moral. If it's illegal, it's not moral. The law becomes my standard for moral. The law is over and above the person. So I, uh, I'll never forget an article. It was an article. There was a debate in the paper. Gee, this must have been 20 years ago. Somewhere I still have that article about whether homosexuals should be allowed to teach in the schools. This is the question. Personal rights letter to the editor. In Texas, homosexual behavior is against the law. These people are breaking the law. We don't hire lawbreakers to teach our students. The answer is no. That's the end of it. Of course, the implication is that if tomorrow we pass a law and say, ah, this stuff's not illegal, which, by the way, I don't think it is anymore, Texas, oh, then it's moral. Then they're, all, they're allowed to do it. So morality shifts based on, who's, on what the law is, right? And interestingly enough, remember we talk about Huckleberry Finn? That's a great book, right? Throughout Huck Finn, Huck, part of him knows that helping Jim run away from slavery is the right thing to do that it's a horrible thing for one person to own another person, right? He comes to that realization when he has this bond with Jim. But part of him, he's constantly saying how he feels guilty because he's breaking the law by helping a slave run away. Do we talk about immoral laws? Uh, well, let's try this in America. Can anybody think of legal holidays that we have? Legal holidays about American history in which we celebrate lawbreakers. Gee, just about every one. Go ahead. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Day. I mean, that one's obvious. He broke so many segregation laws, right? I, you, 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 more than you can check a stick out. I mean, he broke law after law after law after law, right? All these segregation laws. Any other one? Go ahead. Uh, Washington and Lincoln? Well, Washington for sure. In my day, it used to be Washington's birthday and then Lincoln's birthday. Washington's birthday was all over the place. Lincoln's birthday was just in the north. Right? We get two days off of school. Anyway, but Washington broke all kinds of laws, right? He went and he had an armed insurrection against the government. He led it. <coughs> as long as we're in Washington, what about all the other people? What day is that? We celebrate all the people who said, get the king out of here. Yeah, go ahead. Independence Day. Yeah, July 4th, Independence Day. So, you know, we're in a situation in which these people broke the law. Anybody think of any laws in the history of the United States that you think, from your personal perspective, are immoral? Go ahead, tell me one. The whole history of the country. Yeah, I know the one that makes you go to school, right? <laughs> Come on. What were some laws in the United States? Help me out here. 
Go ahead. Prohibition. Prohibition. There's one. First it was immoral to drink. Now it's not immoral to drink because we had a law and we repealed it. Anything else? Think of the history of the country. Here, yeah, go ahead. Voting laws. Say it again. Voting laws like um, with minorities or women. Or what was the word you used? Minorities or Yeah, women? The, the first word. What kind of laws? Hearing voting laws? Word. Spell it. Voting. Voting laws. <laughs> voting laws. Thank you very much. That was an accent. That wasn't that I didn't hear. Voting laws. Yes, voting laws. Women can't vote. For a while, when the United States was founded in many places, white property owners could vote. If you try to vote, you weren't one of those. Couldn't go ahead. Segregation? Yeah, what about segregation? And before segregation? Slavery. What about all that stuff? Remember Harriet Tubman? Who was Harriet Tubman? Who remembers? She was a slave that managed to get to the north and then helped slaves <coughs> escape through the Underground Railroad. She kept going back and bringing people out, right. And by the way, she had what they call, I don't know if they still call it, it was narcolepsy, just would fall asleep all the time. It would just, it would just fall asleep apropos of nothing. Can you imagine having the guts to do that? You could be running for your life, and you know what I mean? We could just fall asleep. That's the end of it. But she did it over and over again. Okay. <coughs> Interestingly enough, it was laws. I'll tell you something. The Fugitive Slave Act. You know about the Fugitive Slave Act? There was always a ballot. Basically, for most of the, most of the history of slavery, if a slave ran away and got to the north, to a free state, the slave was okay. You're free. Just don't go back to the South, but you're free. If you were in the North, you were free. And two things happened that basically changed that, that basically precipitated the Civil War. One was the Nat Turner decision. Does anybody know what that was? There was uh, uh, someone from the South moved with his slave, I think it was to Minnesota. And the slave sued to be free. He lived in Minnesota for years. And it went through the courts. When it got to the Supreme Court, and it was uh, Justice Taney, I think, gave the decision. From which I said, throw the case out. He's a piece of property, not a person. He has no standing in court. Get him out of here. Now, interestingly enough, that, was, that may have been the case in this, but it wasn't true in Minnesota. In Minnesota, you know, black people were considered to have rights, not the same as everybody else, but they weren't considered property, obviously. They had standing in court. And then there was a Fugitive Slave Act. That's where the Underground Railroad came from. The Fugitive Slave Act, basically there had always been an equal number of free and slave states in the legislature, but that was sort of going away. There was just no real way to maintain that because slavery, slavery, by the way, I don't think it was ever outlawed in the North. There were slave, the stories of slaves in New England, but it doesn't pay, right? It starts, gets, gets, cold and snowy, you can't start, you know, the last harvest is September, and until the next April, there's nothing to do. Meanwhile, a slave is a person. You have to feed a slave, you have to have water for a slave, you have to heat the slave. It just didn't pay. But in the South, it paid because you could grow all year round. Okay? So ultimately, we had these slave states and free states, and where you could have slaves was, you know, you got to Texas, and then if you're going to go west, you're in the desert, and you know, no place for farming there. There were even times where... <coughs> Southern senators and politicians calling for the conquering of Mexico and Cuba and other places so they could move the slavery into there. Now, now finally, there were, a deal was cut so that they could have more of the s territories become states where there weren't. So if California was admitted to the Union as a free state, I think it tipped the balance to 13 and 12. Don't quote me on those figures, but I think that's right. And California, even though there are places in California where slavery, I guess, would have paid, but it clearly was not, there were no slave sentiment in California. It was admitted as a free state. And in return for tipping that balance toward the anti-slavery faction, this Fugitive Slave Act was passed around the same time as the, the, the Dred Scott decision. And this said, you can chase slaves into the North. Slaves are fugitives anywhere in the United States, and slave catchers can go and chase them into the free state. Well, this didn't, and this was the compromise to get a slave state. And obviously, with much of the population, it didn't sit well. 
right? Slave catchers were often, slave chasers, who catchers were often killed and other kinds of things, and people didn't like, but they came and did it. Now a slave had to get out of the country, they had to go to Canada. And the Underground Railroad, that's basically what it was. It was a system of safe houses for running, slaves running away, right? Usually places underground, et cetera, et cetera, where they could be, you know, where they were safe and where they could either they could hide. Sometimes there were people called conductors on the Underground Railroad. That's what Harry Tubman was, who would take them from one safe house to another, but not always. Okay, but they had instructions. Does anybody know how the slaves, it was too dangerous to write anything down. Slaves were not allowed to learn how to read, but a lot of them figured it out, right? A lot of them learned on the slide, but it was too dangerous to do that. Does anybody know how they got instructions? Did I sing last time? Follow the drinking gourd? No? How did they get instructions? They'd put it in the lyrics of the song. Yeah, sing. Anybody know the song, Follow the Drinking Gourd? Follow the Drinking Gourd. Concerts are free. Follow the Drinking Gourd. What's the Drinking Gourd? It's the Big Dipper. Right? It was in for the Big So In other words, that's north. For the old man is awaiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the Drinking Gourd. The old man is one of the conductors. And then the, liver, the lyrics go on. <clears throat> Obviously, this was... A place where it was too dangerous for him to come out, so they would just go themselves. The riverbed makes a righty good road. The dead trees will show you the way. And then left foot, peg foot, traveling on. He had one, follow the drinking gourd. They had a, he, was, he only had one leg, and the other one was a wooden leg with just a peg. So he would go and he would walk the trail. They could see the left foot and then the, the wooden leg, and they would know that's the tracks to follow. Okay, there's another river on the other side. The whole thing is a, is a set of directions. Okay, then if they got caught, they... You know, nobody thought about it, right? Some direction of what to do, and they would just sing the lyrics and follow the directions. Okay, in Rochester, New York, Rochester, New York was one of the last stops on the Underground Railroad. There was a permanent exhibit in the museum. You know if it's still there? We got two people from Rochester here that showed a room of the Underground Railroad. This was illegal. Boy, was that a source of pride when I was a kid? I don't know about now. That Rochester was the last stop on the Underground Railroad. Real pride that Rochester fought slavery, right? And I. Okay, and that, there was a permanent that took people who were breaking the law because the law was considered immoral. That becomes the problem here. Never mind about laws in Nazi Germany and laws in the Soviet Union and laws in other oppressive societies. You know, what are you going to do about that? Or laws in oppressive society today. That's the law. Right? Before we went into Afghanistan, it was the law. Women couldn't be learned to read. Women couldn't learn to write. Women couldn't go to school. Women couldn't, you couldn't dress either way. You There's the law. There were police around to enforce it. So what do you do about it, okay? That becomes the big problem. What do you do about the law, a law that you consider to be an immoral law? Well, what makes a law immoral? That becomes the question. Somebody tell me. How can you judge whether a law is moral or not? Some laws obviously are just for, go ahead. I guess if it in infringes on the rights of someone. Yeah, that's what Kohlberg says. Look, in the end, in the end, there are some laws that doesn't matter. Okay, in England, you drive on the left-hand side of the road. Here we drive on the right-hand side of the road. Who cares? Right, just as long as we all follow it. It's, that's really a convention. But it's against the law to drive down the wrong side of the road, right? <coughs> the other day, I'm at a parking garage. It says, no left turn. So you have to go up and around to go down. All I had to do was go like that. And I would be on the down ramp. It would save me a whole 25 seconds. It was all I could do. And this was a parking garage. There are no cops in a parking garage, right? <laughs> all I could do to. And I looked. There was nobody there. But I, and I went up and down and around. You know what I'm talking about, right? But I was parked right at a spot where all I had to do was go. Sp Never mind. Okay? But it's a convention. So you follow the rules. Follow the law. But sometimes laws really make a difference. Laws that discriminate against people based on all kinds of things. And we have, you know, we have problems like that in our society. Is this law discriminatory? Is it not discriminatory? On what basis? How do you do it? Right? Christmas is a legal holiday in the United States. I don't know. There are people in the United States who don't follow, follow, celebrate Christmas. Even Christians who don't. Do you know that? There's one group of the Church of Christ that doesn't celebrate Christmas. It's... I know that because I was working with a family once, and they said, oh, Christmas. It's, it's, I don't know where that came from, they said, but it's the, the crucifixion, resurrection, all the rest, 
It's no good. It's fluff. They don't like. They didn't like it. Well, so what do you do? I don't know. Well, you can have a Christmas tree, but you can have a crash tree. We try hard, right? So we respect every individual's rights. <laughs> I know a person who worked for. I'll tell you, it was, a, it was a Jewish religious group. And she said, you have to call your shots. If they're making all the kids go and bow down in front of a cradle, you say, you got to stop it. What's a Christmas tree? Who cares? What are they going to do? You know, call your shots. You know, just as long. And part of it, but when she was talking, she said, look, it doesn't, doesn't infringe upon us. So what's the difference, right? Hi. Is if you're not trying to force a person into your religion, what do you care? You know, an overwhelming majority of people do it. So, but it becomes a difficult issue. Other things become issues in schools about. I want to tell you something now. It's the first time I ever say it on tape, right? You know the thing about prayer in schools? I'll tell you what happens if prayer in schools becomes the law of the land. The Satan worshipers are going to stand up and say, okay, we want our turn too. Everybody can say his own prayer. Right? That was one of the compromises. Each religion, well, Satan worshipers are going to come up and do that too. I'm warning you. I even saw it on the internet once. So be careful what you wish for, right? If it's longer, it's going to be. But in any case, you get the point. There's a, the, the problem is the, the laws, laws have to be made ultimately in a context. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. What is the, you need a context for making the laws. Let me ask you guys, can I get on the internet here? Good. Okay, a context for making the laws. And this, says Kohlberg, let's go back to the PowerPoint, is where post-conventional reasoning comes from. Post-conventional reasoning protects each individual's rights. That's the basis of morality. The current political system is seen as one among many hypothetical possibilities, and that system must be changed if it doesn't present, protect individual rights, and what is moral, therefore, is what is just, what, present, what protects rights. Okay, come back to me for a second. Okay, this here, never mind, let's go back to the PowerPoint. If you remember, formal operational reasoning talks about hypothetical abstracts based on abstract principles. See, a law is concrete. Do this and don't do that. <coughs> the idea of rights is based upon a hypothetical abstraction of justice. And, see me get my picture in there? Also, <coughs> formal operational reasoning, if you remember, talks about, formal operational reasoning talks about being able to consider hypothetical possibilities and choosing among them, right? Remember the liquids, what one makes yellow? Isolating a variable, it could be this and this, that and that, this and this, try this, try that, try that, isolate them out. To isolate all the combinations. <coughs> and then find the one that applies, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that applies to reality. So Kohlberg says the same thing. Except what he's saying here with post-conventional reasoning as a protection that rights become the basis of morality. The current political system is seen as one among many hypothetical possibilities. And that system must be changed if it doesn't protect rights. What's moral then is what's just. And so come back to me. So thanks. Now I am able to judge a law against a hypothetical abstraction. A law could be moral. It could be neutral. It could be moral, like you're not allowed to shoot people because you like the watch that they have on. I, oh, I like, I like the watch that she has on. I'm going to shoot her and take it. That's immoral. And a law, right, and so that could be a moral law. And you could have a neutral law, like drive on the right. And you can have an immoral law, like if you look, if you're, if you're, we all pay taxes, but if you're black, you can't swim in the swimming pool, in the municipal swimming pool, even though I'll pay taxes for it. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question regarding, like, the, the blindness of, of law. Let's say mm -hmm. two people are found guilty for the same type of crime like possession of an illegal substance or whatever. And you have an affluent white male who gets a sentence of community service <coughs> where a economically disadvantaged minority male ends up with 20 years in prison. Well, that's right. How is it, that? That's right. It shouldn't happen. <coughs> One of the last things that Kohlberg did was working with, interestingly enough, listen to this, Edward Kennedy 
and who's the senator from Utah, the Republican from Utah? Orrin Hatch. Orrin Hatch. Together, right? To reform the federal legal system so that penalties were uniform. It just shouldn't be done. And by the way, you know darn well that in many cases, if it's a female, she'll get less of a sentence than it's a male, right? Female sentenced to death for the same crime as opposed to males are much less, proportionally even. I mean, the females commit less murders, but even proportionally it's less. It shouldn't do that. That's right. That's exactly right. It's not just. You can't base people on how rich they are or what they look. And interestingly enough, most of the studies, if you look at them, it's not really a matter of ethnicity, race, whatever you want to call it. It's a matter of money. If you have a lot, it's very rare is the rich person who's sentenced to death. Very rare. Okay. And rich people are found who are indicted for murder and certain kinds of crimes are much more likely to get off. On the other hand, embezzling, that's quote-unquote a white-collar crime, that, right? The money doesn't know. Oh, if you're rich, you're spoiled. That's the kind of crime we figure you must have done. Okay? So it's an interesting, it's an interesting, you know, kind of a, of a, of a dilemma. You're right. And for Kohlberg, it was one of the most awful things that could happen to in a system. That you decide guilt, and by that you sentence people convicted of a crime based upon standards other than what is the, what's, what's, what's the law? What's, what's the just thing to do? And he knew what happened. I said the last year of his life, that's one of the things, or I, it wasn't the last thing, but one of the things actually when I was one of his students that he was working on very strongly. He even came and reported the meetings he had with Kennedy. It was easier for him to work with Kennedy because Kennedy was from Massachusetts and he was in Massachusetts. When Orrin Hatch was involved too, this was not a liberal conservative kind of a thing. This was a justice kind of a thing. Right? I think it was Orrin Hatch, but it was a conservative senator too. And he did most of the work with Kennedy, with Kennedy of course, because, <coughs> you know, they were... They saw each other more because he was in Massachusetts, but he would fly down to Washington talk to both of them. It was, it was important. That's a good question. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Once again, the individual is more important than the rules or laws, but not because of selfishness. Well, I don't care what the law is. I'm going to blow your head off and you know, take the beer. But rather, it's the, but rather, rights become the basis. We have to protect individual rights, and if the law does not protect rights, it's an immoral law, it needs to be defined. Okay, so come back to me. So that's the basis. That is the basis upon which Martin Luther King justified what he did. It was a higher law, right? There are a few people whom Colbert quoted as showing in their public speeches post-conventional reason. We used to say, yeah, they're all dead, too, right? So, it was, Martin Luther King was one. Pope John XXIII was the Pope in the 60s, and he's Vatican II. A couple other people. They're all dead except Rawls, a philosopher who just died. He was the one that Colbert talked about stage six reasoning, okay? Economic justice, Rawls. In the middle of doing a dissertation, somebody's doing on Rawls principles, trying to apply them to education. But I can't remember Rawls' first name. I think John, John Rawls. He's a philosopher of justice. But these, I think it's John, I'm pretty sure. It's age, you have to forgive me. But these, so for, for him, then, it's immoral not to break a law. It would be immoral to take a slave and turn that slave in and take the slave back to become a piece of property, because people aren't property, people are people. That's immoral to do that. You got it? So what Kohlberg says, let's go back to the PowerPoint, is that stage five is a social contract morality. Society is viewed as a social contract among individuals. It's entered into in order to protect each person's rights and laws that deny a person or groups equal rights are immoral. Okay, come back to me. I'm going to try to get on the internet, and we'll see what we can do here. Uh, who can tell me the document in Western history 
oh, and I'll tell you, I'll be nice to you, it's American history, that clearly states this principle. Let's see if this will let me on the internet. Whoa, not bad. That clearly states this principle, okay, that that society is a social contract that we're, there we go, that we're required by the social contract to, I'm getting there, that governments are made to protect the rights of people, and if they don't, the government's got to change, or in the worst cases, get rid of it. Huh? Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence. Can we get this on the screen? Go back to, there it is. Can you see it? Okay. It says, one in the course of human events becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which connected them with one another and to assume the powers on earth a separate equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them. This nature's God is Jefferson because he wasn't a Christian. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind is required that they should declare the cause which compelled them to separation. We're going to tell you why we had to break away from England. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. Today we'd say all people are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, Jefferson was a deist. Anybody know what deists believe? He wasn't a Christian. He was the only president we had. He had a, he had a tremendous respect for the Christian Bible, by the way. What a, what a magnificent document that New Testament was. And he did he actually did a review, you know, a review on it. But, it, you know, he wrote about it, but he wasn't a Christian. Anybody know what he was? He was a deist. Deists believe God created the world and retired to Las Vegas. Okay? There's no personal God. God created the world. So what Jefferson, by the way, does anybody know who edited it, this for Jefferson? He wrote it, and then there was an editing. Anybody know who did that? Push it down and say it. Benjamin Franklin. Ben Franklin, right. If you look at the original, they have it. You knew that too? See, the people from Rochester knew that. Uh -huh. All right. Now, if you look at that, you'll see the cross outs, and almost all of them are from Franklin's suggestions. Okay? So what is this saying? These truths are self I don't have to prove that people have rights. This is a law of nature. Gravity is a law of nature. Rights are a law of nature. When the creator... And notice it's nature's God, because it wasn't true. Probably. When the creator, whoever the creator, whatever you believe, created the world, people were born with rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay? That's not all of them, but they're there. And life is first, because life is the most important right. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That's the emphasis. That's what we make governments, to secure our rights. And they derive their power from the people that they're governing, from the consent of the governed. Oh, thank you. Okay? And that whenever any government becomes destructive of the ends of protecting people's rights, another right we have, among the rights, is the right to change or to get rid of, alter or abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundations on principles and organizing his powers to its form as to have them, give them safety and happiness. Okay, so come back to me. So here's the principle, okay? There's a gang going around, going and breaking into people's house, stealing their property and shooting them if people get in the way. Probably people with property and of their life, too. So we have two choices. One is to say, stand in front of your house, baby, and hope for the best. Guard it day and night. Or what do you usually do if someone breaks in your house? Push it down. Say it. Call the police. Yeah, call the police. So the police are instituted. It's a government institution to protect our life, our liberty, our property. All of a sudden we find, you see the people across the river there in that other country, or across the ocean there? They're going to come and bomb us and kill us. So you can say, okay, buy a gun. When they come, start shooting. That's what we do. What do we do? People are threatening us. People bomb Pearl Harbor. What do we do? Say, everybody get a gun? We get an army. An army. The government organizes us to protect our lives and our property. Right? It's more efficient. It's much easier to protect your life and property with an army than it is with everyone with his or her own cannon and hope for the best. <laughs> right? 
get the shotgun out. <coughs> That's the principle. That's the principle. You want to go from here to there? Build a road. <coughs> if the money don't go. You want to sell your stuff? Figure out how to sell it. Say, no, 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 no. Commerce, we've decided is a right. We're going to have the government build roads. I want to tell you, I remember what it was like traveling before the interstate system. I was a kid. The first superhighway in New York was pre-interstate. was opened in 1954. New York State Thruway. It's not called a freeway because it's not. Okay? You have to pay tolls, right? It took forever to get from one place to the next. Imagine going from Houston to New Orleans on Route 90. You know Route 90? Eight million stoplights just in Houston. Imagine going through all the little towns. That's what it was like. Commerce was difficult. Trucks were not really a viable form of transportation for most things. It took them forever. Put stuff on trains. We still do that, but... And then you built the... And that was one of the things that really improved commerce and the standard of living enormously. That was probably the, <coughs> the major internal achievement of the Eisenhower administration. That was one of the reasons for the big boom, right, that continued. All of a sudden there was commerce. And you couldn't do that without a government. That's the idea. Okay? <coughs> so, what we have here, then, is a morality that says, let's go back to the PowerPoint, look, <coughs> society is a social contract, did I do something bad? No. Among people, laws are there, and any law that denies rights, rather than expanding rights, is no good. That's no good. Okay? So a law that says, you see, we, everybody has to accept those people. They're property of other people. Forget it. You can't do that. You cannot do that. Okay? Let me tell you. Come back to me for a second. I'll tell you something that's very interesting here. Does anybody know about the Back to Liberia movement? The Civil War in Liberia that's going on now is basically between the group of people who were who were ex-slaves who went back to Liberia to found Liberia and the people who were there when they got there. There's been tension among them since, you know, 150 years. You know what the Back to Liberia movement comes from? It comes from the principle that it is inconceivable for people, okay, this is from, to be part of American society and not have equal rights. It's inconceivable. But these people are not intellectually capable of participating in our government. That's where it comes from. It comes from good stuff and not such good stuff. Now you had people like uh, Frederick Douglass around, who happened to be black and a genius. If you read his works, you can see it. But there were people who were convinced. And other people said, that's baloney. A lot of, you know, it's a matter of opportunity. You know, you take people, you make past laws, they can't learn how to read. No, you know, wonder they can't talk like college graduates, right? Or even like high school. But it, and that was part of it, that there was a, 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 an estimation that the freed slaves or ex-slaves, I can't remember when the Liberia movement came. Remember, the capital of Liberia is Monrovia, and after President Monroe. But I think it started after that. I can't remember if it was before the end of slavery or after. But in any case, that was part of it. That people are not Fortunately, I think we've gotten over that today. Although I'm not sure about it some groups being intellectually inferior, superior to another. Yes, even politicians, they are not a intellectually inferior class. Take my word for it. Okay, okay, I take it easy. I'm just kidding, right? Okay? So that's the idea. You have to provide equal rights for anyone. If you listen to Martin Luther King's speeches, that's what he's saying, particularly his early speeches, right? Basically, right to the end. I have no problem with the American social contract. It's wonderful. It just has to apply to everyone. You can't take some people and say, well, it doesn't count for you. So everyone, and we can do that. We have decided. One of the big things, believe, me, believe it or not, was in Illinois. There was a municipal swimming pool. 
paid for by taxes. Blacks weren't allowed to swim in it. Oh, was there a protest over that? Surprised it was Illinois? Believe me, this, this country has changed dramatically since I was a kid, for the better in many cases. I'll tell you some stories. Does anybody know who the first black person ever was to have his or her own television show? Nat King Cole. Television shows were 15 minutes. You'd have 15 minutes of news. As far as I'm concerned, if they went back to that, we'd be okay. <laughs> okay. Ever watch the last 15 minutes of the news? And then a 15-minute entertainment show. And Nat King Cole would sit with that finger, that cigarette stuck in his finger. That killed him, right? Well, we missed a lot of music because of that. Playing the piano. By the way, Nat King Cole started as a jazz pianist. If you really want to listen to some phenomenal music, John Gay has those tapes, right? Of Nat King Cole's early recordings of jazz music. Phenomenal. And he would sing. He would play the piano and sing. Oh, wow. Got to get him off of there. That's horrible. A black man with his own show was telling. I remember because my parents were sitting, passing out and signing petitions to keep him on the air. But it, yeah, yeah, I come from that kind of folks, okay? But he, in the end, it didn't work. They threw him off. I remember the first time I walked into a department store and I saw a black person behind the counter. I jumped a mile. I'd never seen it before. Actually, I was out of the country. I was studying abroad between high school and college, and I came back, and there was a, uh-uh, I jumped. Just never saw it. <laughs> right? Well, that's economic discrimination. That's not equal rights. Well, here's our jobs that are open, except not to you and not to you and not to you, because of the way you look like. Commercials? There were no black people on commercials on television. On the radio, sometimes people would get away with it, because, you know, you couldn't tell from a person's voice. Well, that's not equal rights. And that's what, that's what Martin Luther King was protecting. He said, I don't want to screw things up. I just want to make it equal rights. And finally, let's go back here. We have the idea of the utilitarian principle. Never mind, utilitarian principle. I'll show you what the utilitarian principle is, OK? Can you see this person over here? Can you get him on camera? Come sit over here. Come sit over here. OK? See this guy over here? Okay, look over there, look over there. I don't mean just a little offbeat. He is criminally insane. <laughs> he has been in a hospital for the criminally insane for a killing spree of killing 25 people that we know of. Probably more. Just last week. Just last week, he said, right? Of course. So he's in the hospital for the criminally insane, and I just got a call that he's broken out. Unfortunately, you can look now. Unfortunately, the job that he had before he broke out was that he was in charge of establishing security of the top secret nuclear plant, nuclear weapons plant, that is right side of Houston. You don't know about it, right? That's because it's top secret. And he's headed for it. And if anybody... He's been out two or three hours. We've had the dog sniffing and this and that. And it's pretty clear to us that's where he's headed. It took us an hour to figure that out. So it's, he's been out three or four hours. He's making for it, right? He's going there. And if anybody can figure out how to get in, he's the one. Because he designed the security system. So we're getting our cars. We're rushing there. And I'm chasing him, right? He's nuts. He has homicidal tense like he wouldn't believe. And sure enough, we see a break in the fence. He got in through a break in the fence, through the sewer system I'm on, and I'm running in the room. Stay, you got to stand up. And I chase him down the hall. I see him in the hall. I run and go like this. Right on here. Go like this. Like, like this. Go. Like this with one finger. See it? I run in the room. He's got his finger on the button that he's going to push. Hold it a little higher. Give me a chance, right? <laughs> he's going to push it. When he does, the nuclear weapon is going to go up in the air, come down, blow up, and explode right in the middle of Houston. <coughs> now remember, he has a right to life. The court has already decided that his sentence is permanent and terminate possible for the criminally insane. What should I do? Get out the taser. <laughs> what I, he, he said, get out the taser. What should I do? Somebody tell me what I should do. I got one second. What should I do? Say it. Say it. Take him down. Shoot! What are you, nuts? <laughs> who, 
Who said that I should shoot the gun out of his hand? Who thought that? Oh, man. If you said that, you've never been a, a soldier or a, a peace officer. You don't start shooting for fingers when you got three, four million bullets. You shoot right by the middle. Nothing personal, okay? <laughs> now, on what basis can I deprive him of life? That's his absolute right, and it's the most important right that he has. Depending on how his actions will impact the lives of other people. Uh, right. I can take his life because... Finish the sentence. He's going to kill everybody else if you don't. Yeah, he, I, he's going to kill everybody else. I'm saving a lot of lives. Okay, thank you very much. We'll get you more therapy soon. Okay? <laughs> That's right. The utilitarian principle says... Let's go back to the PowerPoint. The utilitarian principle says... First of all, the right to light takes precedent over all other rights. So if I have to choose between one right and another right, okay, I choose life. But it says when one individual's rights are in conflict with those of another, we choose the action that brings the greatest good to the greatest number. Winners win more than losers lose. Okay, so come back to me now. Okay, so there's no doubt about it. He's, gonna, he's a loser because I'm going to shoot him. But there are millions of winners. Okay, all the people... And this applies to things less serious than that. For instance, let me show you something else. <clears throat> we have another person over here. Right over there. Wave to your fans. Okay. Once more, your name on the floor. Heather, right? <laughs> Heather, she's not a murderer. She's just the most obnoxious, rotten pain in various parts of the anatomy that you've ever run into. <laughs> Right? Unfortunately, she owns a piece of property that's right between two mountains where I'm putting a major road. If I don't get that piece of property for the road, I'm going to have to blast through mountains or go around. It's going to cost millions and millions more of tax money. And Heather says, I'm not selling. I give her all the arguments. She said, I don't care. You need the property? No, I just don't want to sell. Get away from me. So, what do we have? Eminent domain. Push it down, say it. Oh, you push it down. Okay. Eminent domain, the right of eminent domain. Right here, I'll write it for you here. We'll go to the tablet. It's the right of eminent domain. Here we go. Ready? In theory, remember, under the social contract, we have invested our rights. Okay, the protection of rights, come back to me. The protection of rights in the government. The government protecting our rights. Now, what has to protect Heather's rights, but come on. There's commerce, the right to commerce, the right that we've made that a right here, right? The right to, to travel, to do this stuff. So this one pain in the you-know-what is not going to be able, is not going to be able for her rights to property to take the rights the way of so many of the rest of us. Now remember, this is not, I don't have a right to shoot Sam because he's nuts or because I don't like him or because of what he did before. It's only for rights. I don't have a right to shoot Heather because every time I talk to her, he makes you want to throw up because she's such an obnoxious human being. I don't have a right to take her property away because of that. Even if she were a sweetheart, it wouldn't make any difference. I am only allowed to do it because it's her rights versus others. However, there has to be an attempt. You know, Sam made a joke, get a taser out. The truth is, if I had the choice between a taser and a gun, I should hit him with a taser. If I'm sure it'll work as well. You've got four million lives on the line, you've got to think about it. Same thing with her. I have to pay her for the property. I'll tell you a story about it. You stay through. When they build the throughway, They took away farmers' lands. Yes, there are farmers in New York State. What's the matter with you? We think, oh, New York, that paved over island at the end. Forget that. Finger Lakes, here, come over here. I'm going to show you New York State. I'm going to show it to you. What's the matter with you people? Here. Put it on here. Here's New York State. Looks something like this. Yes, it does. Here, I'll get it. Wait. So, not quite. Here, let me put this down. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
No, it's not supposed to be green. Not supposed to be green. Where's the eraser? There's the eraser. Here. This is more wood. Wait, 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 wait. There's New York. And down here is Long Island, and this is New York City, this mess here. But this stuff, the Finger Lakes, Cooperstown right here, gorgeous, Lake Otsego. Here, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Niagara River, Niagara Falls, Route 17 down here, the most scenic highway in America voted once. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Farms, hills, mountains, a beautiful state. Everybody thinks about this mess down here. All right. Come back to me now. So there's a farmer in New York State, New York State. You know those delicious apples? Yes, New York State, Red Hook, New York is where they were developed. Dairy farms. There are less than there used to be, but there are still plenty of them. So they took away this farmers, and he comes and he says, look. He said, you didn't pay me fair value for my land, so we paid everything else. He said, yeah, the trouble is when you build the road, all my cows are on one side, and the and the pond, the drinking pond's on the other side. I don't think my cousin's going to be able to run across the New York State's way to get the drink, right? Went to court, and he won. They paid him more. I'll tell you something that bothers me terribly. In Texas, you know, I think it's the 50, is it a 50 foot? Uh, the beach, beach is 50 foot or 50 yards? 50 feet, right? Yeah. 50 feet. I'm glad there's somebody here who knows the rules in Texas, right? <laughs> okay. Are you a history teacher? Yes. Good. Thank God. Okay. So, the shore, from the sh shoreline, 50 feet in, all the beaches belong to all the people, right? If the ocean encroaches, then you go back, okay? So if you own a piece of property that's 80 feet from the shoreline, all of a sudden the ocean encroaches, and it's, all of a sudden it's 45 feet, tough noogies, you lose it. The beaches belong to everybody. You know those places at the, at the west side of Galveston where they build them, and like, it looks like private beaches? They build them so there's one little run. They're not! If you want to swim there, go. Beautiful white sand. I go there, I take my son and his friend. He said, uh, can I help you? I said, yeah, get out of my way. <laughs> I said, I'm going to swim. I didn't say anything. Yeah, go ahead. So the ones that try and charge people to go in, like, that's illegal? I believe so. I don't think you can charge people for the beach. The beaches belong it's to everybody. It's a state park. What? What Heather's talking about is the state park. <laughs> well, that you can do, because that's the state. <laughs> But on Galveston, yeah, yeah, those private beaches on Galveston are not. Yeah, go ahead. Am I wrong? Uh, no, but her, what she's talking about, the parking lots are beyond the 50 feet <coughs> property. That you can charge $4 million charge, for. But you can walk in all you want. Yeah, you can walk in. Parking? Oh, that's something. It's a private property. The problem is, from what I understand, if your property suddenly is in the state, then you just lose it. You're not compensated for it. So to say that all the beaches belong to everybody, that's fine. But not to compensate people, to, take, to deprive them of property without compensation, can't do that. You can deprive an individual of his or her rights for the greater good, but you have to try hard to compensate for the rights. You have to pay. I, and I, I am telling you, I don't think it's, it's right. It's right to have the 50 feet, but that, that thing is not right. I remember one time I'm going to Big Sur, okay? And I run in, and I see this little row with this teeny little sign, right? And I go down, that it's a way in, and I go down this twisting, turning road, and one other car comes up, and I had to pull off into the woods to let the car by. I mean, it was the middle of nowhere. I go down the bottom, federal government's there, <laughs> $5 to park, right? They, they had it everywhere. I mean, I thought it was the middle of nowhere. I was stunned, right? There they are, right? There were four other people there. They had us, like, hit us all up for the parking. So who knows, right? So <laughs> that's okay. That's okay because it's the government, and they claim they're collecting the money for improving the beach, et cetera, et cetera, the great good for the great number. Whether they do or not is something else. We have fights about that, okay? So that idea of the utilitarian principle, okay, that, that's how we run a society. The problem is, say some people, actually I did this with a Protestant minister, he pointed this out to me, but wait a minute, wait a minute, here we go. Let's go back to the Declaration of Independence here. The problem is, oops, whoops, whoops, whoops. The problem is here, I've got it now. 
Read this part. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And according to experience has shown, shown, that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Come back to me for a second. In fact, although these guys are ticked off when they're writing this, and so they're saying that, you know, then they're going to go on to say, but we've had it. But in fact, what they're really stating in a different way is, look, this is still a contract. When you enter into a contract, you're abiding by the rules of the contract. And if you go to court and somebody says, look, this person will deliver me five tons of vegetables. Let's make it reasonable, right? A half a ton of vegetables every day in a week, right? And, and I will buy all my vegetables from say, him, yeah, from him for a year, and then the third time the person does it, it's five pounds short, and you say, I'm breaking the contract, you break the contract. Of course, I'm not going to let you do that, right? This is a binding contract, and for minor things, it's no good. Now, if the person keeps short chain, you'll say, give the guy the other five pounds of vegetables, right? They're not going to let you do that, right? Because contracts are heavy things. So when you have a social contract, you don't just get rid of it quickly, right? Let's just do one more thing here. And so take a look at the Declaration of Independence. Here, I'll show it to you. Come back to the Declaration of Independence. So here, it says, but, but this guy, this guy is too much. Okay, the history of the present king is a history of injury and usurpations, all having direct objection, the establishment of an absolute tyranny, we got to get rid of them. And the rest is showing a basis. Look how long, oops, nuts. Wait, I'll get there, I'll get there, I'll get there. Hit the wrong button in line with the rest of the semester, okay? All of this, all of this that I'm showing you is showing over and over again how the king violated the contract and violated the contract and violated the contract. All, every one of these things is a violation. Every one. That's most of the declaration is that, not that magnificent preamble. Okay, more, 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 more. Look at all these violations that they're piling up to show he's the one. And finally here, when he tends to British we have warned them and we've told them over and over again, time and time, to tell them over and over again, stop doing it. As a matter of fact, come back to me, after Lexington and Concord, remember? British troops are drawing near, shouts brave Paul Revere. Remember that? Even after that, Paul Revere's right They still said, many of the people, including Jefferson, by the way, I believe, said, all we want is our rights as Englishmen. People like Sam Adams said it's hopeless. Just give us our rights as Englishmen and we're back in. And they didn't write the Constitution until well after the battles of Lexington and Concord. So the question then becomes, what do you do if you have a social contract that's okay, but still gets tramples on people's rights? What about the people who, meanwhile, are suffering from segregation while I'm trying to change it? And that's we'll get to stage six. We'll do that after the break. See you then.